Good day. My name is Michelle Lavander. I'm the founding director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thank you for joining us for our Health Matters webinar, The New Wave of COVID, a conversation with Dr. Ashish Jha and Fennet Nirupal. Earlier this month, President Biden declared that the COVID-19 pandemic is over, prompting a sharp backlash in public health circles. There's plenty of room for debate about the direction of the pandemic, as we'll be discussing today. Cases of COVID infections rose again this summer, and long COVID poses concerns, especially in vulnerable communities of color. While deaths are on the rise, according to the latest CDC numbers, they're far, the cases are far lower than at the height of the pandemic. Hospitalizations are slowing for the first time in two months, and there are declines in the amount of the virus detected in wastewater. Yet public health officials caution that it's too soon to declare victory, even if the public is suffering from pandemic fatigue. There's still challenges. For instance, now that the government is no longer paying for and distributing vaccines, getting one has been confounding even for seasoned health policy experts, and the vaccine rollout in the commercial market has been plagued by insurance complications and delays, as one of our panelists recently reported in the Washington Post. Here to help us to understand the implications of the situation and storylines and approaches to pursue going forward, we have two distinguished panelists. Dr. Ashish Jha is a physician and the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University, previously appointed by President Biden in March 22 as White House COVID-19 response coordinator he led the development of treatments and access to and newly formed vaccines, testing and surveillance, and helped design infrastructure to respond to current and future disease outbreaks. Dr. Jha has published nearly 300 original research publications and is a frequent media contributor. He was born in India and attended Harvard Medical School, where he also previously was on the public health and medical school faculties. Fen Nirupal is a reporter for the Washington Post Health and Science team. He covers public health, infectious diseases, and LGBTQ issues. He joined the team in 2020 to cover the pandemic. He previously spent five years on the local politics team covering DC government and politics, Virginia elections, and government accountability. Before joining the Post, he covered the California State House for the AP and the Portland suburbs for the Oregonian. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of individuals like you, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, and the California Endowment. You can tweet about this webinar with the hashtag new wave of COVID. And we will be archiving this conversation later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our speakers first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for your questions. Feel free to share general comments in the chat. Because we have many people joining us on Zoom, we'll ask you to write your questions for our speakers into the Q&A panel. You also can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems. Now let's get it underway. Fennett, um, let me turn this over to you. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Zhao, for joining us. So let's start off with the present. How would you describe the state of coronavirus now, and how concerned should we be? Yeah, so first of all, uh, Michelle and Bennett and the whole group, thank you for having me here. Um, look, here's how I think about it. We are in uh, a very different place with COVID, with the coronavirus, than we have been. We are, the emergency phase of this uh, pandemic was officially declared over, the public health emergency is over. And we are in a new normal where we are going to see increases in the virus, decreases in the virus. We're going to see two to three waves of of infections. Obviously, we're always going to hope that those things do not turn into very high waves of infection that cause serious um, illness. You know, in terms of today where we are, it is clear we had this late summer wave. Uh, it uh, really appears to have crested and heading down. Uh, but as we head into the winter months, each of the last few winters, we have seen virus come back up again. So my view, my expectation is we're going to see a further decline for the, probably the next month or two, and then we're going to see the virus starting to rise again as we get into the holidays and beyond. Um, the waves vary in terms of their size, and when you look at things like hospitalizations and deaths, um, while they have clearly gone up, they are below where they've been, where they were last summer, where they were last winter. And my hope is that we can continue to drive down those uh, rates of serious illness so that it becomes less and less of a problem for our country and our society. 
So I've heard you make that point a few times before that we're in a new normal now and that we have uh, tools to respond to the pandemic in a way we haven't before. This has also drawn a lot of uh, criticism and we've heard critics of you say that you're understating the risks that, that come with long COVID and the risks to the elderly and immunocompromised. So how do you respond to that criticism? Yeah, I, I think there's there are two sets of issues here. So let's take long COVID and the risks to elderly and immunocompromised separately. Um, when I was at the White House, but even now, I spent a lot of time thinking about how do we protect older Americans? How do we protect immunocompromised? Uh, it is undoubtedly true that for relatively young, healthy Americans who've been vaccinated, maybe have been infected, the risk is extremely low. When you look at data for older Americans and for immunocompromised Americans, um, and immunocompromised, of course, is also a very diverse group of people. So let's talk about older Americans, for instance. The data is actually overwhelmingly clear that if you're up to date on your vaccines, and you get treatments when you have been infected, your risk of hospitalization and your risk of death is exceedingly low. That is not for the average person, that is for high risk. people. So it, I, have, I wanna be very, very clear. If you're not up to date on your vaccines, if you're not getting treated, coronavirus continues to pose a substantial challenge, especially if you're at elevated risk. But if you're at elevated risk and getting up to date on your vaccines, uh, taking treatments when you get infected, things that remain free for most Americans, uh, then your risk of getting into serious trouble is very, very low. One last point on the immunocompromised, and we can talk about long COVID. You know, immunocompromised, very diverse group of people. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about whether immunocompromised people benefit from the vaccines. The evidence on this is actually quite clear. Most immunocompromised people benefit at a substantial amount from vaccination, and most immunocompromised people are still eligible to get treated. So given that, our messaging absolutely has to be for immunocompromised and older people, keep yourself protected. Now, long COVID is a different issue, right? Which is not about hospitalizations and deaths, but a potential long-term sick value. And let me, uh, let me kind of lay out how I think about this. There is no question that long COVID is a real problem, uh, the prevalence of which is hard to estimate because there are different definitions, but most of us believe somewhere between three and 6% of Americans uh, potentially suffer from long COVID. That is a real problem. Majority of those people were people who were infected early in the pandemic, who have continued to suffer, and we have to find strategies of uh, treating them, helping them get better, supporting them until those treatments become available. There's a different question, which is what is your risk of getting long COVID if you got infected today? Most people by now have been infected already at least once. Most people have gotten vaccinated. What's very clear is your risk of developing long COVID moving forward, new long COVID, is relatively low and can be made much lower by keeping up to date on your vaccines. There is no question the risk of long COVID is not zero. Uh, the only way to avoid long COVID completely is by get, not getting infected. But the risks of long COVID have also declined quite substantially over time. And we've got to start looking at risks as they are today and not conflating it with risks as they were in 2020 or 2021. And on the long COVID risk uh, in particular, oftentimes when I write about COVID, that's the big question that I get or the big criticism that I get is what about long COVID? And there seems to be something of a perception that anyone can get struck down with uh, debilitating long-term symptoms, even if you're otherwise young, healthy, and don't have uh, underlying risk factors. So you talked about uh, the risk being low, but how should people who are otherwise healthy and don't have other risk factors for severe illness, how should they look at their risk for long COVID? Yeah. So here's what I, I would say. And the problem is a lot of the discourse on this stuff happens on social media platforms like Twitter, where individual stories can really uh, move conversations. But if you try to be data driven, here's what we know. You know, the best estimate, there was actually a calculation done by a a scientist recently, the best estimate that he could come up with looking at data from the UK, which actually does a much better job of surveillance, is that if you get infected today, your risk of developing long COVID is about 1%, one in 100. Your risk of, debilita of, de of developing debilitating long COVID is about one in 500, about 0.2%. Two more points. It seems to be much more skewed towards high towards older people. So they, at least based on the UK data, far less likely uh, among young people. And we also know that getting vaccinated, being up to date on your vaccines, reduces your risk of developing long COVID by 30 to 50 percent. 
So those numbers, one in 100, one in 500 is for all comers, lower if you're vaccinated, much lower if you're uh, if you're younger. Look, at that point, you're starting to get into extremely low risk. So if you're a 25-year-old healthy person and up to date on your vaccines, the chances that you're going to develop long COVID, while not zero, because nothing is zero, is extraordinarily low. And, and you can decide what trade-offs you're willing to make. What I say to folks is, if you're at elevated risk, super important to get treated, super important to get vaccinated. Uh, younger people, I think it's helpful and it's important, but obviously the risks are lower. One of the things that um, you pointed out with this low risk level has me thinking that one of the big dynamics that we've been seeing throughout this uh, pandemic is that there's a difference between the individual risk and the societal risk. So 0.2% sounds uh, small, but when we're talking about nearly every young person getting COVID, that can still amount to a lot of people. So how do we resolve um, this individual toll and individual risk with the overall societal toll of the pandemic? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I mean, look, if it was 0.2%, it's still a, a, a size number, as you said. Um, here's how I would think about it. We should be thinking about how do we drive that number lower, right? And so I actually do think that if everybody got up to date on their vaccines, we would drive that number lower, um, probably by a third or maybe half. That's point number one. Um, there is some emerging evidence. Uh, it's not overwhelming, so I don't want to hang my hat on this, that getting treated lowers your risk of, of long COVID. There are at least a couple of studies to that effect. Um, and so my general strategy here has been, you're at a very low rate anyway. If you can then drive up vaccination rates, get people treated, you're going to drive those numbers even lower. And... At some point, then the question is, what do you want to, What else do you want to do to try to drive that number lower? Um, we are going to be at a point where the risk is going to be, even at a societal level, reasonably low. And then obviously, we want to make sure we're providing care for people. And it becomes really important at that point to be investing in treatments for long COVID so that the small proportion of people who do get it, that we have ways of taking care of those people. So now you're at a point where you've had some time after your job in the White House, and I'm sure you've had time to reflect on it, too. What would you have done differently? What would I have done differently? So it's a really good question. Um, I actually just had earlier today uh, a conversation with Ron Klain, who was the chief of staff for most of the time that I was at the White House. And I was reflecting on my time at the White House. And one of the goals I had had uh, when I had gone in uh, was really to think about how can we bridge the the increasing partisan divide that we have seen around vaccines, around treatment, around COVID more broadly, and actually around vaccines more broadly. And um, we made a lot of efforts. I made a lot of efforts, certainly on outreach and trying to talk to people across the political spectrum. Uh, it's just, it's a very difficult moment in this country where these things have become partisanized. And, and if I think about things that I wish I had made more progress on, that is certainly one of them. Uh, closing that uh, political divide, that partisan divide, I think is extremely important for our country. Um, you know, viruses obviously do not care about political uh, divides and political ideologies. Um, we have got to really make sure that everybody is benefiting from this incredible scientific progress that we have seen on vaccines and treatments in this pandemic and not turn anti-vaccine sentiment into this broader attack on vaccines in general, which I believe represent the biggest kind of boon to the health of the world's population, probably along with sanitation and uh, some other uh, incredible public health things. So we've really got to make progress there. Right. So when you're talking about um, the partisan polarization here, really what we're talking about is Republicans and conservatives and growing anti anti-vaccine sentiment in those circles. So when there's so much distrust towards the public health establishment, what can you do to break through? So the first thing I will say is bad information spreading is actually a bipartisan problem, unfortunately. There are uh, people, the kind of zero COVID crowd that consistently undermines vaccine efficacy, constantly says immunocompromised people don't benefit from vaccines, constantly sort of undownplays vaccine benefits. Uh, I actually think that is also very, very harmful. So I think that's point number one. Uh, point number two is getting, um, you know, rebuilding trust happens to me. I mean, there's no one magic formula here, right? The, the, the strategy has got to be uh, thinking about places where public health has made mistakes and owning those mistakes, 
talking about why those mistakes happen and how we're going to do better. And I think there are places where public health uh, as a community, and again, it's a diverse community, has made mistakes. Um, and then doing more outreach and conversations. I found when I was in Washington that when I sat down with people who at least politically appear to have very, very different views than I did and had long conversations about complex issues, we actually got to a very high degree of agreement. It's hard to see that on Twitter. It's hard to see that in kind of little sound bites. Um, when in a polarized country like ours, you're not going to get agreement on social media, but you are when you sit down with people over over lunch, over coffee, uh, and have a longer conversation. That's where we can begin to find common ground in a lot of these issues. We didn't hear COVID uh, come up that much at last at last night's Republican presidential debate. Do you think COVID should be a factor that's on voters' minds minds as uh, we head into an election cycle? You know, what I would say is less whether COVID itself should be. I mean, we are at a point where I don't think about COVID as a singular risk, but I look at COVID as part of a broad set of risks of respiratory viruses that every winter is probably going to kill between 80 and 100,000 elderly and medically vulnerable Americans, unless we can really drive up vaccinations and treatments. That is sort of kind of baked into our healthcare system now. That is an unacceptable level of, of, of suffering and death, and we need to be doing something about that. When I think about voters and what they need to be thinking about, to me, it's less about COVID and more about the fact that we have entered an age where we are going to see more outbreaks, not just these three viruses, RSV, flu, and COVID. We're going to see novel viruses in the years and decades to come. It's very important that we actually build up our defenses as a country, as a public health, a healthcare, as a nation against these viruses. And I think that absolutely should be on, on the people's mind, just as a people's mind includes making sure we have a strong national defense against enemies, we should have a strong biodefense strategy. And biodefense is both against man-made, but also naturally occurring threats. That is a really important thing that I think voters absolutely should be thinking about when we think about the future. We also aren't really hearing President Biden really place a big emphasis on these issues as he heads into his re-election campaign. Should he be talking about public health more? I think the president has talked, I think the president spent a lot of time, and again, I don't get into giving people political advice about what people should be doing. What I say is the president spent a lot of time talking about COVID when it was a true crisis. Um, one of the things the president certainly said to me and it recognizes that there are other big public health challenges as well. Gun violence, he just announced a big initiative on that. Uh, mental health, where the president spent a lot of time talking about mental health, particularly among youth. Um, opioid crisis, again, th these are issues that are also very, very important that I would argue have kind of got neglected when we were all focused on the emergency phase of the pandemic. It made sense that we were not talking about these other very substantial challenges. I hear the president talking about all, all of those, those as well as respiratory viruses, uh, RSV flu and COVID. That's the right way to do this. I don't think we should be singling out COVID right now as like a, a unusual threat. It is now at a point where mm. it is a major threat, but so are these other public health issues that I raise. So one of the big stories of COVID right now is we have this new vaccine out. Vaccines are now commercialized and people are having challenges accessing this vaccine from it not being in stock at pharmacies and doctor's offices to insurers not covering to insurers not covering them, even though they're required to do so. Who's at fault here? Who's at fault? Um, here's, uh, let me kind of get brought, set the broader picture of why we are where we are. Um, last year, when I was still at the White House, Congress made very clear they did not want to continue funding any more vaccines and treatments. We asked them literally dozens of times. At the end of the day, Congress has the power of the purse, and Congress says, we do not want the federal government funding this uh, anymore. We can only do so much, and we could not continue buying vaccines and treatments that Congress no longer wanted. So we really had no choice but to switch over the both vaccines and treatments to the commercial system. And we knew we'd had to do this at some point anyway. Um, my preference, our preference in the administration was not to do it quite yet. At the end of the day, Congress made that decision. Now, switching to the commercial system, as everybody knows, we have an incredibly complicated healthcare system 
with hundreds of different insurance companies, uh, tens of thousands of different pharmacies. I mean, many of them are part of big chains, um, lots of complicated rules. And so we have been, and again, I started this work, I know HHS has continued this, that we started the work of that transition knowing that the initial uh, phase of that transition was gonna be bumpy. There are insurance companies that have not updated their uh, their rules of eligibility, even though they are required to. So I think it's really important for the administration to continue plugging away and solving these problems. I'm hopeful that they will get solved, um, but no question about it that when you're forced to switch from the government as a single purchaser buying all of these things to a commercial system where you literally have hundreds of different purchasers, middlemen, uh, pharmacy benefits management companies, et cetera, it is going to be a little bit bumpy in a country as complex as ours. And you mentioned that uh, federal officials did anticipate that there was going to be something of a bumpy transition. So could the White House and the Biden administration have done more to minimize uh, the glitches and the issues that Americans have been facing as they're trying to get vaccinated now? So we certainly, and again, look, I, I it's hard for me to comment since I'm not a, I have not been at the White House for three months. So uh, in some ways, you really have to ask them, what have they been doing? I will tell you till the point that I was there, we were aware of this. We made a plan for how we were going to deal with this. Um, and what were the major steps that needed to be dealt with before September? And um, and I know many of those things got done, whether all those things got done, what didn't get done, why not? Those are all questions that at the end of the day, I just have not been involved in those conversations. I'm not there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what else the Biden administration can or should be doing? These are good questions. What I will tell you is that there was at that point a clear understanding when I left that we, we were forced into this transition, we needed to do this transition. Um, and that there were a series of things that needed to be done to make sure that transition was as smooth as possible. So now that we're coming off this summer wave of COVID, looking back, what was different in how our country responded because we no longer had a public health emergency? Yeah, so if you think about what the public health emergency enables, you know, there are a lot of people who look at it as a symbolic thing of like, it just shows the importance of, something. I think symbolism has been very important, but at the end of the day, three and a half years, almost, you know, three and a half plus years into a, uh, a pandemic, uh, you've got to worry a little bit less about the symbolism here and focus on what are the policy tools. The most of the policy tools that public health emergency gave most, I'll talk about a couple of exceptions to this, um, were around healthcare flexibilities. What do I mean by that? In the public health emergency, hospitals could set up beds in a parking lot. They didn't need anybody's permission. Hospitals could have anesthesiologists working as ICU doctors. Well, actually, it's not a good example, but a pediatrician working as an ICU doctor, even though they don't have the standard training for it. Because in an emergency, you need to be able to do those kinds of things. And our assessment, the assessment of the Secretary of Health and Human Services was, we don't need those flexibilities anymore. We did not need those flexibilities this summer. At this summer, when we had the summer wave, we did not see hospitals getting overwhelmed. We did not see hospitals trying to set up uh, beds in parking lots because they were running out of beds. Uh, and it showed that the ending of the public health emergency actually made a lot of sense. The couple of other things beyond healthcare flexibilities was the free tests that went away. And so the administration uh, has used other means of trying to get testing more widely available. Uh, I think that's important. But most of the public health emergency tools really had to do with healthcare capacity and managing healthcare capacity. I actually think the summer wave proved very clearly that ending the public health emergency was the right thing to do, because I don't know of a single hospital that was overwhelmed this summer where those flexibilities would have been useful, uh, certainly not the entire nation. So on the point about free testing, this summer it was also difficult for Americans to differentiate between a cold or a COVID because it's because it can get pretty expensive to test everyone in your family and to test uh, repeatedly at every uh, every time you develop uh, symptoms. Yeah. And one of the things that we've been hearing is that uh, does treating COVID as the new normal uh, mean that we're going to go back to an inequitable status quo? Uh, that we're going to that we're going to see the usual racial and income disparities in healthcare uh, get worse as we as we head into this post acute phase of uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. So let me actually make a broader point, which is, I don't think the goal should be to go back to the way we did things in 2020. And that is often what people think I'm saying or what people perceive as the goal. 
And let me be very clear on why not. I have for years um, practiced in the hospital over the holidays. It's just like one of the times I'm often in the hospital. And when I come, the first day I walk into the hospital in this late December or January, what I always find is that the hospitals are totally full, patients are lined up in the emergency room, and the healthcare system is sort of at the brink. This was pre-pandemic. We, we did not have a great strategy for manning at RSV and, and flu and uh, and really making sure that those were not burdening our systems. Throwing COVID on top of that, the goal should not be, well, let's just go ahead and we barely could manage RSV and flu. Let's just go ahead and throw in COVID and, and see how it goes. It's not going to go well. Um, we actually need a very different strategy. That is the new normal. And the new normal has got to be way better um, for uh, for people. And I am seeing, by the way, comments come up about what ending of the public health emergency uh, does and does not mean. So we can we can talk about some of the comments that are coming in. But let me um, but let me just finish this thought. So the new normal should not be a return to 2019, which was inequitable, which was which had 30,000 Americans dying every year of flu, which should not ever be a goal. Like we, I think flu deaths can be cut by two thirds or three quarters from that if we do a better job of getting people vaccinated, getting people treated. Um, and preventing infections and preventing infections for flu is a whole series of things. Um, so there is a series of strategies that we should be deploying for respiratory viruses during respiratory season that should lead us to a new normal where the, where the infection numbers and more importantly, the death numbers are dramatically lower. What are those things? I mean, I do think mass in crowded indoor spaces can make makes a lot of sense, especially when infection numbers are high. We've got to do a lot more on indoor air quality and improving indoor air quality. We did a lot of work there in the administration, but this is not a fundamentally federal thing. This is going to be, have to be done at city and state levels, uh, local community levels, improving indoor air quality, obviously vaccines, obviously treatments. Turns out all the cleaning stuff that we often talk about as hygiene theater for COVID, you know, the deep cleaning stuff, didn't really help with COVID, but it does help for flu and RSV, particularly flu. So hand washing, that comes back into play for some of the other respiratory viruses. If we take that kind of an approach, I actually think we can lower the burden of respiratory infections much more broadly. And that is not, um, you know, that is not uh, a, a normal of 2019. That will be a more equitable normal, but that'll be a much, much better normal. That's what we should be striving. And as you mentioned, we're, we have a few questions in the comments about uh, the implications of ending the public health emergency, including yeah. uh, one about how the end of uh, the emergency also coincided with the end of the expansion of the safety net uh, for people yes. who were able to stay on Medicaid and receive expanded uh, SNAP benefits. And another comment uh, mentioned that uh, people also had challenges uh, accessing Paxlovid because of the end of the emergency. Can you address some of these other issues that yeah, people yeah. So, are bringing up? Absolutely. So look, we expanded our safety net substantially. In the pandemic. I'm going to give you my personal view, not the view of the Biden administration, not the view of anybody else, but my personal view. I think that was all awesome. Like we, I believe we need to have a stronger safety net in our country. And Congress, again, in, in end of December, when the omnibus was passed, passed a law in the omnibus saying Medicaid, the Medicaid uh, um, eligibility, uh, you know, kind of re, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but basically checking for people's eligibility and, and going back to the old way we did uh, Medicaid, that was going to happen starting in April, no matter what happened with the public health emergency. So Congress divorced that from the end of the public health emergency. So if we had ended the public health emergency in May as we did, or if we had kept it for another five years, that Medicaid disenrollment was going to happen. I personally want to see more people on Medicaid, or at least I want people more people on insurance. So I would not have wanted that. But that was no longer a, a feature of the public health emergency because Congress made that decision. Uh, SNAP benefits were lost. There were other safety net benefits that were lost at the end of the public health emergency. And so when I said the major effects, I meant on the health side, the public health side. Let's talk about Paxlovid. This comes up a lot where people are like, oh, free vaccines stopped or free Paxlovid stopped. They didn't. None of those had anything to do with public health emergency in any meaningful way. The reason Paxlovid was free then is free today is because the U.S. government bought a lot of it using U.S. government dollars. And so Paxlovid remains completely free today for every single American. 
Now, at some point in the future, um, and HHS is working on this, at some point we will transition to Paxlovid becoming like other treatments. We then developed a whole new program to make sure the uninsured continue to have access uh, to Paxlovid and vaccines. Uh, but it remains, so that is unrelated to public health emergency. Again, this comes up over and over again where people are like, oh, free vaccines and free Paxlovid went away. It just didn't. Like, you can go to your CVS today if you have COVID and have a prescription, and you can get Paxlovid for free today. Whatever your insurance is. Because a big part of this audience is a journalist. Let's talk more about COVID journalism. Yeah. Uh, from your perspective, what distinguishes good COVID reporting from bad COVID reporting? Yeah, you know, the problem is a really good question. And obviously, there's not a, a simple answer. here. Um, what I would start with is I think there were lots of things that everybody in the pandemic got wrong. I don't know of any institution, I don't know of any individual who kind of nailed every single one. Uh, there were certainly things that I got wrong in this. When I think about the lessons learned for the fourth estate, you know, journalism, uh, the press, um, what I, there are a few things that I think are really, I mean, one is distinguishing expertise. There were lots and lots and lots of people who stepped up and said, I am a COVID expert. What's been remarkable is watching these people become Ukraine experts, constitutional law experts, mm -hmm. and now AI experts. Uh, by the way, just to be very clear, I'm a public health expert. I have no expertise on any of those <laughs> other issues. I have opinions, but you don't want my opinions on those things unless, you know. So um, there is a lot of, it, and it can be difficult because people have MDs after their name. They may even be at a good institution. But the challenge is that expertise, and many of you who are, are deep into this understand this, is that expertise is very specific. So for instance, if you wanna really understand immunology, the immunologic impact of the virus, actually, I'm not the first person you should call. I think a lot about this, I read those articles, but when I try to understand it, there are immunologists I call because immunologists have very specific expertise. So there's a lot of very specific domain expertise. That is one point. And I saw a lot of, and I'm just talking about the mistakes because there was a lot of fantastic fantastic journalism. But where I saw mistakes happening um, was exactly in people going to somebody because they're an MD who really didn't understand the complexity of the issues and, and, and getting that wrong. So getting that deep expertise is very important. The second area is what I sort of think of as like uh, the kind of almost false equivalence issue um, that we've seen this, by the way, we saw this for years in climate journalism. Uh, we saw this a lot here where it, let's talk about, for instance, the vaccines and whether vaccines are worth getting or not. Um, if you talk to 50 immunologists, virologists, vaccinologists, and say, should a 70 year old be getting a vaccine, 48 or 49 out of that 50 will be like, absolutely. But you'll get one or two who will say, yeah, I don't think so. And what I read in the articles is the same one or two saying, I don't think the vaccine is all that useful. And then one of those other 48 saying the vaccine is really necessary. And then you say there's a scientific debate. It really actually isn't a scientific debate. The science is pretty clearly on one side and being able to explain and transmit that in fact, there is pretty broad consensus on these things. There are places where there are disagreements or disagreements on whether 22 year olds should get vaccines. I think a 22 year old is better off. There are other reasonable people who don't. That's a perfectly er good area. There is not are not serious people who think 70 year olds should not be getting the new vaccine. But I'm sure you can find someone out there who will say that. It's really critical not to create that false sense of, of equivalence. And unfortunately, even in major New York, um, newspapers, uh, not in your articles, Bennett, but I will tell you in a lot of articles, uh, I saw, again, it's the same one or two vaccinologists, virologists who are constantly undermining. And then it sounds like, well, you got, you got disagreement. You have expert disagreement where there really was no expert disagreement. So having a sense of that, and the last point I'll make on how you counter that is really having a broad uh, Rolodex, as it were, having a broad group of experts that you reach out to. Because once you start doing that, you realize, actually, there are many areas where there's not a ton of debate uh, because the evidence is pretty clear, one-sided. And that is a place where I think, uh, again, journalism could have been better. Let me be very clear. A lot of terrific journalism over the last three and a half years. I'm just talking about things I saw where I thought, yeah, this is this keeps popping up over and over again. Do you have any recommendations for how journalists can expand that Rolodex? 
Uh, because a lot of times, especially on COVID stories, you do kind of see the same uh, experts quoted over and over. And I know I'm talking to someone from an Ivy League school here, but there also does seem to be a bias uh, towards some of these prestigious institutions when we know there's a lot of uh, smart, pe uh, smart people at state schools and, and other smaller colleges, too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are a lot, of the, a lot of the expertise is not in the Ivy League. So, and a lot of the bad information I will argue has come from some people who are not experts, uh, but are Ivy League institutions and therefore feel like, hey, I'm at this fi fancy Ivy League institution. I can talk about this. Uh, it's, it's a problem. I mean, there's no simple way to do this, of course. And my uh, kind of advice has been begin with the societies. So there are medical societies. So, if you want to talk about infectious disease experts, you can find hundreds of them. Uh, begin with the Infectious Disease Society of America, right? Start with their leadership. Talk to them. Get them to give you recommendations of other people, including ask them, who do you think would disagree with you? Mm -hmm. What you're going to get there is somebody who is smart, who they respect. There are plenty of people I respect who disagree with me. And that is actually good and healthy. I've had I've had journalists ask me, who would disagree with your view on this? I love that question because I will give them three names and I'm going to give them names of people who I think understand the topic, who understand the data and have come to a different conclusion than I have. And I think that's a great place to, to start. So I would often start with the societies, the American Association of uh, Allergy and Immunology, NIH, um, and go from there. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, give me five names of people who are not at Ivy League institutions, uh, because there's a lot of very, very smart, capable people who are not at these, uh, quote unquote, very prestigious institutions. So on your point about people who disagree with you, do you have recommendations for um, experts who, who have uh, disagreements on whether we should still be treating uh, COVID as an emergency, who you, who you think you have reasonable disagreements with and would provide good insights? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, when I think about who, so look, there are there are certainly people who believe we should have ended the emergency like a year before we did. And I think about smart people like Monica Gandhi. I Monica is at UCSF. I have often disagreed with Monica, but she's a very, very smart, capable infectious disease expert. And whenever I have disagreed with her, most of the times I have thought she has a reasoned argument, I disagree with it. Um, so she tends to be on one side. I am struggling right now to think of a credible scientist who thinks that we should still be in a public health emergency. And the reason is, is that if you think about most of those emergency tools, unless you're using it to say, to, to expand Medicaid or give SNAP, which is a whole different set of issues, right? But th that's actually using COVID to drive a different set of safety net policies you want, which is actually a perfectly fine thing. Again, I believe in a stronger safety net, but you've got to be honest about that. But uh, public health experts who think we need to be in an emergency because it is still an emergency, I, I am struggling to think about who is a credible scientist who thinks we still need to give hospital flexibilities, we still need, uh, now there are plenty of people who think we should, the government should still be buying these vaccines and treatments. In fact, that's a view I personally held uh, and still hold, I would love to have done it for one more year. Um, that was unfortunately not an option that that Congress gave us. That's a view that I think many many of us hold. Um, but I I am not I can't think of someone who thinks we should be in a public health emergency for public health response right now. So before I op open it up for audience questions, uh, what do you think are lines of uh, coverage that are right best up for reporting? So I do really think that we need to reformulate. Um, COVID into this broader set of challenges that we face. And, I, you know, I have always um, struggled with sort of the comparisons to influenza and say, was it just like the flu? There are two problems with that. Um, one is COVID is going to be different than flu. It is a different virus. It will act differently. And second, I have always felt that we under treat and under manage flu, uh, that we do not take flu seriously enough, that flu kills way too many vulnerable Americans every year, unnecessarily so. And so I think a really important area of coverage is how are we as a country now taking this whole set of respiratory viruses, 
Yes, they kill a, they'll probably kill 100,000 vulnerable Americans unless we make real progress on vaccines. But they will also cause massive disruptions at work. People will be out. Schools, kids will be out. It is just really bad for our country and our society to have this level of infection every winter. Uh, I'd like to see more coverage about that and the solutions that we already have. Obviously, uh, the, the partisanization and the politicization of a lot of the vaccine stuff is a real problem. And I think we need to find ways of getting that under control. You know, one of the things I always remind people is that the state that had the one of the highest levels of, of childhood vaccinations in the year 2019 is Mississippi, uh, reminding people that there are lots of very conservative states that have very, very high rates of vaccinations. I think it's extremely important that we bring vaccines back into a bipartisan lens. And I think we need more kind of stories and coverage about how that has gone wrong and what we can do to bring that back in. Okay. With that, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you to uh, uh, for questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you both. We have a lot of questions, so we'll do our best to go through as many as we can in our remaining time. I'll start with a question from Edwin Nayako Nayasani, who says, any recommendations of how to address vaccine hesitancy issues, really speaking of what you were just talking about, within rural communities and other demographics like the Native American sovereign nations where there's jurisdictional issues um, as well? Yeah, I think there are two sets of issues I would I would raise here. Um, so I'll start off by saying like my mental model uh, four years ago, I uh, sound extremely naive, but I'll just admit it was that you know the way you move people is you have experts and give you the scientific evidence and everybody listens and people do the right uh, do the thing that's going to make a difference for them and you just come to realize like well, that's not the information environment we live in like the information environment we live in is incredibly fragmented and people have varying different kind of information diets and there are two things that i think are really important one has been talked about a lot and one has been talked about less one is thinking about who the key voices are the key messengers are and that is often not a public health voice on television saying you should go get vaccinated. Um, it is often a religious leader, the barbershop, the community-based organization, sometimes the political leader, often the local doctor or nurse. And so a, an important part of driving vaccine confidence is working with people in those communities who are listened to and trusted for other health and other important issues. That's sort of point number one. And I think that has been discussed, and I think we've got to do more there. The second part is, you know, I often think about the supply side versus the demand side. The supply side of information is, you know, what do you want people to say? But we don't think enough about the demand side. And the demand side is, what do people have questions about? What are people in the community, what are they thinking about? What are they worried about? What's on their mind? One of the challenges with getting people vaccinated right now is it's not a top priority for a lot of people. So listening to what is on people's mind, what are the concerns they have, and then connecting your message to meet that demand is really, really important. I think that's how we're going to make progress. I don't think we're going to make progress by just getting public health people to sharpen their messages. Maybe that'll help a little, uh, but the, it's going to be much more at the local. We have a, a question from Billy Hanlon. It's it's kind of a statement question, so bear with me here, uh, who says uh Dr. Francesca Bodwin, the director of the Long COVID Initiative at Brown, your colleague. Uh, recently, Francesca, well, yeah. Uh, recently told USA Today, I would be remiss in saying the Recover Initiative has been a little bit of a disappointment and still waiting to see headline results coming from a more than $1 billion investment by U.S. taxpayers. And there's been media attention around that lately. And I hope that attention is actually some fuel to continue doing the studies that need to be done. And then Billy went on to say, Stat News also recently reported that the, con the congressionally provided funding of $1.15 billion to the NIH to study long COVID is nearly spent through already. And the question is, Dr. Jha, how will Congress provide the NIH with more resources and funding for these studies that need to still be done? Yeah, it looks a very good question. And Francesca is uh, absolutely right that we need... Um, we need more progress on this issue. And, and let me uh, say the following, even though I said the risk, the new risk of developing long COVID has gotten much lower, we still have many, many millions of Americans suffering from long COVID. And we have got to find new treatments. And that means studying therapies, interventions, and doing more randomized trials. 
And uh, and that has got to be the next phase. I, there's some amount of work to be done on the pathophysiology and understanding the virus, or not virus, uh, the, the condition long COVID. Uh, but that to me is a small amount of money. So, you know, I, I think it's really important for Congress to not walk away from this and say, okay, we've made some progress with the money we've spent. We have got to put more money in and we've got to focus those dollars on what I would like to see more randomized trials of new therapeutic options, whether they be drugs, they be other things, uh, to try to actually help people feel better and alleviate a lot of the symptoms. Uh, because again, millions of people suffering on, uh, on an ongoing basis and we need to make progress there. We have a question from Stephen. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, uh, Langel. What lessons learned from the response to COVID-19 might be applied elsewhere when there are unexpected outbreaks? For instance, how might COVID-19 inform the strategy for responding to any outbreaks that might take place amid a degraded healthcare infrastructure and people in close quarters, such as the crowded, um, such as those crowded, uh, well, into bomb yeah, shelter. Yeah. So, but I think we have domestic issues too, not just in, in war zones about crowding. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question, Steve, which is if the lesson out of all of this is, okay, here's how we, what we do with COVID alone, that will not, I think, serve its purpose adequately. Um, there is no question in my mind that there is a series of lessons. So what are they? The critical importance of doing more surveillance. Um, I have said publicly, and I, I will reiterate, that I think the lack of a good surveillance system and the lack of testing early in the pandemic was, I've described it as your kind of original sin of this pandemic that got us off on the wrong foot, was sowed the seeds of discord and distrust. Um, and we have we've made a lot of progress on building up surveillance systems and testing. We've got to continue that work. Um, there's, so there's a lot of lessons learned. Obviously, we've learned a lot about how to manage respiratory viruses in a crowded space, masking, better indoor air quality, things that we knew much less about five years ago. So there are clear lessons. Yes, they should be applied to COVID uh, future variants, but they should be applied to respiratory viruses more broadly, including future pandemic potential pan uh, respiratory viruses that we might see. And Dr. Cha, as you um, make these suggestions, what do you think has happened in terms of really understanding the deficiencies of our public health infrastructure? There's also been so many departures from local public health officer uh, uh, offices. There's been funding uncertainties with allocations, you know, really dependent on year to year budget cycles and efforts to undermine the authority of local public health officials, some of whom had received death threats. I mean, do you see um, any efforts to to change any of that? Yeah. So this is a place um, where I worry a lot about where we are as a country. Um, public health has been underfunded for decades. Um, and if you look at the public health infrastructure, much of it still relies on fax machines, uh, handwritten stuff. Uh, it has just not gotten the kind of upgrades that we've seen in our broader healthcare system because the dollars into public health have been relatively trivial. Then public health was at the forefront of managing a, the biggest crisis, one of the biggest crises our country has ever faced. And, and it turned political. And as you said, Michelle, we saw death threats. Um, a vast majority of people who were leading public health uh, agencies three, four years ago have left. And so we've had this massive turnover. Uh, a lot of the new people have not, weren't there, don't, haven't quite learned the lesson. And then on top of that, you see, and, and I don't mean to be overly partisan about this, but some in more conservative states, an effort to undermine public health authority out of the fear that the public health authority has been overused. That, I think, leaves us all substantially weaker. We know what we need to do, but it's going to be a long road. We need more investments in our public health infrastructure. We literally spend $4 trillion on health care. We spend a fraction of that in our public health. We have got to change that ratio. Second is we have got to really start rebuilding the trust in public health. That does mean restoring some of the capabilities of public health agencies and trying to make this less and less of a partisan thing and more of a reminder that these public health crises, whether they be viruses, opioids, climate change, gun violence, they are bipartisan things. They affect people across the political spectrum equally. Um, we have got to do a better job of, of building that back. Uh, it's going to be a long road. I see no quick fixes. And as I said, for the short run, I worry about where public health is. 
We have a, a couple of questions about all these stumbles with the vaccine supply right now with the commercial rollout. One from, I'll kind of combine them here. One from Sally Jane's asking, why can retailers handle flu and other vaccines easily, but they're stumbling with COVID? What's the structural difference? And then Don Gresham asks, uh, if you could speak to how long it might take for the vaccine supply to increase, and if there's any manufacturing ins inspection or shipment delays that would make a difference. Okay. Good questions. So it's a good question. And the question is like, well, we do this every year for flu. Why don't why why is this harder for COVID? It's the first year. We do it every year for the flu because we have a system of manufacturers, distributors, out to pharmacies and other locations. And that system, it's not the same manufacturers. It's not the exact same distributors. Uh, the manufacturers for flu vaccines are different than the manufacturers for COVID. So that automatically sets up one new set of things that needs to be done. Uh, second is insurance companies have nice billing codes for for flu vaccines. Nice billing codes. They have billing codes that are well-established uh, and they've been using it for years. They have to put in new billing codes for COVID vaccines. Uh, that has taken, some insurance companies have done that. Many insurance companies are still struggling. Uh, my understanding, talking to both insurance companies, but also talking to the administration, is that that has been a major, that was a ma major stumbling blocks over the last few weeks, but that has been largely fixed. Um, again, speaking to manufacturers, my understanding is there's plenty of supply, meaning there are plenty of vaccine doses, but there's still challenges in distribution. You know, when the federal government owned the whole process from, I mean, we didn't manufacture when I was in the U.S. government, but but we got it from the manufacturers and we got it delivered. It was a kind of soup to nuts. One thing, didn't have to worry about insurance, didn't have to worry about out of network, in network, didn't have to look at eligibility. You could just walk in and get it. Our healthcare system is insanely complicated. And flu has largely worked because it has taken years and we have kind of worked out all the kinks. I'm trying to work out all the kinks for COVID. I do think, and to the second part of the question, I do think we're going to see uh, increasing supply and availability in the weeks, not months, but weeks ahead. But it's going to continue to be uneven for a little bit. We have a question from Eric Gunn, who says that as just the um, COVID um, positivity rates are becoming less reliable, that in his state of Wisconsin, he's been directed to looking at wastewater surveillance and asks how to make sense of what what he's seeing in those charts. Uh, for example, in Wisconsin, where the concentrations are above what they were in April and whether it's accurate to equate some wastewater levels to some past um, COVID count levels. Yeah, this is, these are good questions. I do, so I'll tell you what I do. I look at wastewater because positivity rate, remember positivity rate is both a numerator and a denominator. And the number of people getting tested and what they're getting tested for has changed dramatically over the last year. So you can't look at a positivity rate today and compare it to a positivity rate of a year ago. It just is not interpretable, at least not by me. I don't know how to interpret it. So I look at wastewater because wastewater is the one reliable source of data on how much infection is happening. And again, I have not clicked on the chart, so I'll talk about national data and I can talk about some of the regional data. We have seen kind of in the last, Two weeks, wastewater peak and starting to come down nationally. And until about a week ago, it was still rising in some regions, falling in others. And now all four regions, again, broadly speaking, we're, we've seen it down. We are a big country with different populations. That doesn't mean it's in every community is falling. There may be some communities where it's still increasing, but these are kind of broad national and regional trends that we are seeing. And it actually, so, and then when you look at the absolute levels, we're about half the level of last summer and about a third to a half the level of this past winter. And that tells me that while there's still plenty of infections out there, they are lower than they were last summer, way lower than they were in the Omicron wave. And obviously we hope that those continue to go down. Um, so that's kind of where we are, but, but locally, I mean, nobody lives in America, right? People live in Boston or Providence or, or Milwaukee. Uh, so you got to look at the local data. I mean, when I say nobody lives in America, I obviously I mean like we all live in America, but the point is that like you got to look at your local numbers and those will vary from community to community. And uh, Dr. Cha, I know you're on a tight schedule. Do you have time for two more questions? I do. I do. All Let's right. do it. So uh, Valeria, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Richuli says, 
Uh, she's wondering what your thoughts are on the Florida health officials contradicting CDC guidance on the COVID vaccine. And I, I suppose that question could be asked more broadly, not just in Florida, of, of states where, where public officials are, are giving messages that contradict uh, CDC guidance. Yeah, you know, I, I guess um, I, I have to say I, I, I find some of the uh, guidance coming out of the Florida health officials. And I, I will talk about Florida a bit more, and then there are other states too, but particularly Florida, disappointing. Um, and, and that's because, look, CDC goes through a very comprehensive, transparent process. You don't have to agree with their conclusions, but you have to deal with the data that they're sharing. And you have to, and if you, and I think if you're a public health official, a public health expert who wants to disagree with the CDC, which of course everybody's more than willing to, more than welcome to do, the responsible way to do that is to come up with, with is to show better data or to show that the data analysis is wrong or your interpretation of that data is wrong. And what we have seen from the Florida Department of Health is proclamations largely without data. And that really troubles me because it, we can disagree on uh, our interpretation, but if we just decide we're just gonna come up with our own facts or not, or not deal with the data that CDC is presenting, um, I think that just makes it very hard for people living in this country to know where whom to trust and how to manage it. So um, what I have encouraged my colleagues who disagree with the CDC analysis is show us the data of either where CDC is getting it wrong or uh, how, why it is that your interpretation is different. Um, I think that's just a responsible way of managing uh, public health at a moment like this. My personal view is I think the CDC analysis is largely right. I generally support it. Um, but there have been times too in the last three and a half years when I haven't, when I've disagreed with the CDC analysis, and that's fine. That's normal, and that's what you'd expect to do, but we need to do that in a thoughtful way. So um, our last question, um, which takes things in a little bit of a different direction, is from Sunita Sarabji, who says, so many communities around the country are also facing the ravages of climate change, extreme heat, flooding. Has climate change significantly impacted the, the rise in COVID cases? Yeah, it's a very good question. I'm going to actually answer that question a little bit more broadly, and then I'll hone in on the specifics. You know, I often say we are, and I've been saying this for a, a decade that we are entering an age of, of pandemics. Um, we are entering an age where we're going to see a lot more outbreaks, uh, local, regional, national, international outbreaks. Why do I say that? Um, we're seeing more and more uh, human-animal uh, spillovers uh, driven by deforestation, other environmental changes, globalization, and then, of course, to this question, climate change. These are all forces that are going to drive more and more outbreaks. Um, that said, once outbreaks happen, for whatever reasons that might happen, climate change also impacts the ability to manage those things uh, because viruses and humans react to the environment that we are, are that are around us. Um, and that is, uh, and you know, so the, I think that is the fundamental point here is that climate change, in my view, represents one of the major challenges facing public health over the next decade. Um, and beyond, of course, and there is an intersection between climate change and infectious diseases that we need to understand better in order to make sure that we're really preparing and protecting people the best we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Ja and Fennett, for your excellent uh, remarks, this invigorating conversation, and thank you to our audience for your smart questions and the great uh, parallel conversation in the chat. I would also like to thank the team working behind the scenes to produce this webinar, content editor Ryan White, communication strategist Apoorva Mander Bishu, program specialist Andrew Perez, and contributing editor Fran Smith. We'll be sending you a survey asking for your feedback on today's program and for your ideas and other topics of interest to you. Please take a moment to complete it. Please consider also supporting our Health Matters series. Um, you have the information here on how to do that. And we will be archiving this webinar a little later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. Thanks so much for joining us and have a wonderful day.